I was asked to do a presentation on um, red grape winemaking. There is nothing white in this presentation. <laughs> there is no even suggestion of anything white in this presentation. Um, you'll notice at the top I've got handmade at the top there, not homemade. I've always felt, um, when you say to somebody, do you want to try my homemade wine? They sort of pull back a little bit and go, oh, and, and then they're surprised, and you get, you didn't make this. So I've moved on to using the word handmade. Um, I've mentioned white wine, we're not covering white wine. If you want to know how to make white wine, you're in the wrong show. Um, we're also not covering tea bag and orange peel wine. We're not covering parsnip wine, we're not covering coffee wine. So it's the first time I've first time I've run this presentation. So we'll do questions as we go along, but be gentle with me. And, and the guy behind the video camera, if you can just the, the press needs your attention now. <laughs> so we'll do questions as we go along. You'll find there's not a lot of words in the slides. There's lots of pictures. The pictures will keep us on track, and I'll make it up as we go along. That's, that's, that's roughly how it goes. What we're going to do is there's two parts to this presentation. I'm going to cover a little bit of growing and a little bit of, and it, it's a whistle stop tour because it's based on are you a grower or a maker? And I, and I think we'll, we'll, just, we'll just explore that a little bit and then we'll get into the guts of red wine making. Red wine making, I think, is, is a well kept secret. It's, it's, it's a lot easier. You can spend a lot of time pissing about with white wine and it's just, you've just wasted your time. <laughs> it's just not worth it. When we go through section two, I will be going through the process, i.e. what you're doing and why, and then what we'll also cover is the kit you need. Um, and we'll go from everything that's big and shiny that, that we all dribble and dream about to a piece of rubber hose and a bucket. So we'll cover different types of equipment, uh, different benefits to it, all that sort of, all that sort of jazz. Um, now, I've got a clock here that tells me how long I've been rambling for, but I'm also on batteries. <laughs> so if it all goes dark, I'll just go Ooh, like that. We'll consider that's the end of it. So, part one then, grapes. Are you a grower or are you a maker? Um, why do you do it? Why do we make no wine? Well, this is me. Um, that's an approximate price, but I, I reckon red wine comes in uh, your first room at about 87 pence a bottle, certainly below a quid. Um, you're also dealing with no hangover whatsoever. You know what's going on in your wine, and I can drink a bottle of my wine and get up in the morning. I can drink a bottle of something from the supermarket and wish I didn't have to get up in the morning. It, it, there, there is a lot of permissible chemicals in red wine. Um, the list is quite frightening. I use sulfite, yeast, and a bucket. There's, no other, there's, there's, there's nothing else in there. I don't, I don't get into um, something I should say at this stage, so that I've got some defence when the heckling starts. Is there's hundreds, hundreds of ways to make wine. I like to think of it as an art, more than a science, because if you leave. A bunch of grapes in a bucket, in the corner, you will get a wine of sorts, all on their own. I promise you I've tried it, not intentionally, it happened by accident, but it does work. Yeah? Because of how things grow, grow, grow and, and form. So, for me, red wine is a little bit like hanging meat. A lot of you guys know I, I breed and butcher wild boar. And, and beef, for instance, you've heard the term hanging beef. What's actually going on is that meat is, is decaying and you're or getting older, it's maturing. Um, while it's maturing, you're picking the optimum point along that decaying process. They call it maturing because it sells better. If you say, oh, that's 30 day decayed meat, it's saying to me, it sells. So you're picking the time. The amount of oxidisation it's had, the amount of time it's had on maybe some oak or in some oak barrels, you're just picking the right time to drink it along that timeline. You're helping nature along. Beer making, I think, is more of a recipe and a science, and you're blending. In. Let's be honest, barley grows in a field, 
you can't actually go squirt and drink it. Barley didn't grow with, it grows dry, you're actually, you're actually forming a recipe there and, and forcing it to do something that perhaps it wasn't designed to do. And beer making for me is different and it's interesting for different reasons. Um, it's fun and it's the only hobby I know of, and I'm prepared to take comments on this, where you can buy all your equipment, all your grapes and save money you want. I don't know if anybody else has got you all deadly quiet. This is terrible doing it to people that know what I'm going to say. I've done this presentation to WIs and small holding groups. And of course, I've got, I've got, I've got, a, I've got a safe audience because I know them less, apart from probably one or two of them, they don't all sit there stony quiet looking at me. <laughs> we're sitting. Say something. So, so we're into growing or harvesting. Um, I've got to confess, on a maker. I've got 50 regent vines and the best thing I ever did with my regent vines was buy my wife some electric secateurs. Look at them grow incredibly well. Uh, about 18 foot a year if I grow. Um, only forever and things and poking and prodding things. And then this year we've lost most of them because what? I've just slayed them and we go, I oh, really can't be asked. It doesn't work. So I don't. I, I personally don't think the climate is has enough sunshine, has enough weather for red grapes. There's some cracking white wines out there. There's some cracking people doing white English wine, both still and sparkling. Red. I, I think we struggle as a nation. Um, you see on the picture here, um, just just an example of some grapes in boxes. Um, can any, anybody tell me which is the photo of the, uh, the English grapes? Is it the ones at the bottom that are blue and looking a bit cold? <laughs> um, buying grapes then. For me as a maker, I, I buy in most of my grapes. And I, and I did that for the simple reason. The only reason I, 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 I do some grapes is because two or three years ago, two or three people started packing up doing grapes. And I went, Ooh, if we haven't, if nobody else is doing it, we're not going to get any. So um, I got, I got involved and got started on that. Um, the nice thing is you've got variety. I mean, look, we've got four or five. We've got the wrong people here. But there's probably four or five varieties on the table today. Um, Continental grapes are so much easier to make up. English red grapes are hard work. The acids are high, the sugars are low, the flavours are low. So you, you, you've really got to work to get it together. It's that good flavour, all, all the grapes you tend to find here, Brian. So, because I've seen. There are some, there's there's that place that's further north than here. Yeah, it's like the, the, the there are some north winery registered. Yeah, there, there are some very very mainly rondos. Yeah, because they uh, lend themselves to. Rondo, Rondo and Region are a good varietal for here because uh, they're actually uh, what the Germans grow as well. And yeah. German climate is very similar to ours, soils are similar and good fit and a good match. Rondo's a little bit peppery. Um, it's an, once you've tasted a Rondo, you'll recognise it again. Uh, the guy at the vine house said to me, before you plant Rondo, go and buy a bottle to see if you like it. It's, it's a different flavour of it. Right, so it's a, yeah. yeah. But as, 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 a, as a bizarrely <coughs> journalistic rule, some of, the, some of the red wine makers do a very good job, but red wine will taste thinner, flavourless, um, it's often been capitalised to get to get more, uh, get some sugar into it to build it up a bit. Um, I think red grapes struggle in the UK. I so say I've got 50 farms, but I really struggle to get the crop out of them. Um, and you get a nicer finish. You get a wine that you can put together. Um, red red grape wine making is easy. Chuck it in, crush it. Get some yeast on it, let it go. There's an 80 20 rule with red wine, and it does really apply. You can get a drinkable bottle of something very, very easily. And I've, I've, I've had friends go, Oh, I'll give it a go this year. You give them some basic instruction, and away they go, and they make 
a reasonable bottle of wine, a very drinkable bottle of wine straight away. But that extra fuel, I just want a little bit more nose, I want a little bit more complexity, some tannins, then you're getting into the fine tuning. And I think for a lot of us here, the learning and the, and the tweaking and the, is, is what it's all about. It's much easier with continental grapes. So that's, that's really a whistle-stop tour of why you, do, do you grow or do you buy? I buy. That's why I buy. Um, that's really, if, if, we've got, if we've got any questions now about growing, I'm quite happy to do any questions on, on, on grape stock before we move into making it. Is it to do with the fact that you're Midland Z and the, I mean, me down on the south coast, I'm right in the middle of the English white wine growing region. Yeah. And would, um, it be, would it lend itself to something like a Romno and something else to have a go at? I've, you can, don't let me put Pure you on the basis of being closer to the warm bit of Europe than yeah, no, absolutely. There is a there is a north south divide, which is why I mean we were talking about this earlier. Um, I turned up in shorts this morning. Uh, and other people turned up in fleeces and jackets because they come from up north. Um, there is a temperature divide. Yeah. Um, there is a lot of uh, commentary goes on about how far north you can grow grapes yeah. at all. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. I don't right. think it's a downtown of wine, wine and grapes you grow right like in Scotland. I'm like, not going to say to you, don't grow red grapes. Give it a go. It's the, 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 the microclimate of your site, your, what the French call the, your, your terroir, 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 however you pronounce it. Um, I haven't got the Gallic shrug or the accent, so it doesn't work. Um, will make a difference. Mm. The winds, the mists, the temperatures, um, whether you're growing them on gravel or chalky soil or clay soil, it's all in the mix. You might find you've got a perfect spot for them, go for it. Mm -hmm. But it, the making of an English red grape into wine will be hard, technically harder. Right. Any, any other questions before we move into making? Okay, like I said, I'm going to cover the process, what we're going to do, and also what you need to do with it. Um, red wine, as I say, very easy, sort them out, and some people don't sort their grapes, some people do. There's, there's not much sorting going on today. I've had Spanish grapes where you've had to take bits of glove and secateur blades and all sorts out of it. Um, Mog. But, <laughs> Mog material <laughs> other than grapes. Spanish grapes, and, and Spanish grapes, I think the pickers are a little bit more um, loose with it. You'll get a lot of store, and I mean big lumps of store. Um, the Italians are very tight and very clean. Um, I have known people ferment parts of the box intentionally. I oh, wouldn't give it a bit of, no, it won't. It's not over. Um, <laughs> it's a nasty bit of palate wood, you know. Um, you get it crushed, once you've crushed it, there's always the conversation. Again, there's a lot of it, a lot of this is, is open to, uh, to debate, but it's all open to debate. Do I want stalks? Some stalks, no stalks. Or You're drinking that by Christmas? Yeah, I don't put much stalk in. Um, and you get a different, the stalks do make a difference, and if you start doing English red, you don't want any stalk because it'll be green. If you're going to put stalk in, get it nice, uh, nice and brown. It wants to be woody. If you haven't got any stalk, okay, just put some of the palette in. No, uh, it wants to be woody, dark, and it wants to be thicker stuff as well. Um, I have um, one of the wines that did ever so well at one of the competitions. Uh, somebody left. 90, uh, left me with 19 cases uh, when I was doing some grapeshipping. Uh, uh, can't be asked. And I literally chucked them in a bucket, stamped them down, sprinkled some yeast on them, and then um, just left them to it. Sprinkled, sprinkled. Oh, hello. All right. <laughs> uh, sprinkled some yeast on them, and that came together very, very well. In fact, I've got to say. It's the best Merlot I've made yeah. today. It's the best Merlot I've made. So, how easy, you can make it as easy as you like. 
Um, fermentation is a sterilising process. Because you're murder. I don't use a great deal of sterilizer. Um, I don't sulfite everything. My sterilising equipment is made by hose lock. And has a squirter on the end. My press gets washed down, my crusher gets washed down, my fermenters get washed down. I only bother about sterile. Sorry, I only bother about a, a, a greater level once it becomes wine. Now, once it's wine, we've got to pay attention to it. And my tanks, I don't sterilise them. They get they they had red wine come out of them. They will get washed with hose lock outside. I then seal them up and put a bottle of alcohol in them because I've never yet had a bottle of alcohol. Um. I've got a piece in my notes here that says blue toast. And you know, I can't for the life of me remember what that is. Uh, blue toast. Alright. So you've got marmite on it, is that your yeast energizer? I, d I don't know, There's, there could be something going on. Yeah, no, no. That'll come back to me in a minute, we'll, we'll cover that later. Um, something I did do um, to start with, which is very, very obvious, after you've worked it out, is okay. the juice is where your, your, the base for your wine. I was very, oh, let's make the yeast up in a big starter and put a big starter in. Um, that's half a gallon of water going in. Oh, I'll just rinse that off over the fermenter. Uh, I've got it, sorry, there's people now going, oh, it's tipping washing up water in the, in the, in the fermenter. Um, my fermenter's this size. Um, I loosely cover that, we'll get on to fermentation um, in a minute. But I was, I've, I've got a paddle that I press it down with, just used to wash it off. The point is you're diluting your juice. Don't dilute your juice. I'm not saying you should sprinkle your yeast, but what I'm saying is you should keep diluting your grapes down to a minimum. Um, so we've got them crushed. You can see here, uh, that is a photo of, of um, I don't know if that's a stock photo of one or one. You can see there's very little stalk in that. Um, stalk comes in in various sizes, even through a crushing you stalk like that, you get it in different sizes. Um, I think your spot leaves a little, you will get a piece yeah. in it, won't you? Um, different methods and different machines work in different ways. Um, I reckon it leaves about 5% of the stalks in, ish, um, as a guess. So if we go on to the stuff then, what's the best way of crushing it? Um, you've seen the big machine. I think some of you a few years ago, we had a hammer here, didn't we? Um, but there's also the bucket. And I've had some success with the bucket. The big question is, what is the best thing to actually use as a device for doing the crushing? Now I'm going to take votes on this, so I hope you're all watching. Now I'll listen up. What votes on what, what is the best thing to use? If you've got a bucket full of grapes, I should have done A, B or C, but what do we think is the best device for crushing the grapes? Plates of meat. I, I get some yeast straight in. I personally think a ginger bird in stiletto gill shoes, but no. <laughs> 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 I've not got the red feet, mate. Is it sweet or dry? Is it sweet or dry? <laughs> so, 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 <laughs> so the votes are in. That's it. Oh yeah, that ah, yeah. Oh, uh, and it doesn't work. You want a pair of bunnies. Now, obviously, from a sterile point of view, we've been to see Mr. Hoselock. Yeah, we don't want something you've just been through the garden in. And to this end, I thought what I really need now is a photo, because a lot of this is stock photos off Google. So well, on Google Images, I thought I know what I want is a picture of some dirty wellies. So I went on to Google. <laughs> <laughs> That was one, I wasn't sure whether we'd have a mixed audience today, so I thought, mm, no, I'll better be careful. Some of them were, were well, anyway, we'll move on. <laughs> so, again, I'm, I'm going to go back to hygiene. They get washed, yeah? This is going to go through a fermentation. It's going to get clean. Um, 
I've seen somebody today, I'm not going to name names, <coughs> it's come out of having sulfide in it, drum, they've hosed it down and, and I'm, I'm pleased that Mr. Hoselot lives here as well, but it's then been sulfide in again and washed and wiped and, no, it had something in it that stopped grubblies growing in it, and that's a technical term, grubblies. For those of you who have not made <laughs> red wine before, grubblies are important. If you've kept some sulfite in it, you've not had, and probably for, oh, God, me on this because I don't use it, a couple of months, three months, that'll keep the container fresh. Keep it free, yeah. Uh, rinse it out, you're done, and away. It's got a good seal. Yeah. If you're crushing with your wellies, though, and we're back to, so wash them down, clean them down, you're away, as I say, it made a cracking wine. What you need to think of is how many grapes you've got in there. Because if you get too many grapes in, it, you get back to crushing them with your feet again. And put, when you do get to pouring them out your wellies, you've you really got your maths wrong. Other ways of crushing, that works. And that works very, very well. A bachelor's paddle, put one of them, and I'm quite a fan of these. I'm quite a fan of these because you've noticed there's no taps in there. Yeah? Um, yeah. Put your grapes in there, whiz it up, and it does work. They need to be destalked when they go in there, um, but crush them up, that works, that works out so well. In fact, that, that five gallon of white you had was done like that, um, works very, very well. So, we're going to move on now to the next stage. Any, any questions on crushing? Has everybody heard about destalking with a milk crate? No, no. Uh, okay. Mr. Hose Lock and a milk crate gives you a perfectly sterile milk crate. No, it is. Wash a milk crate down. If you've crushed <coughs> with your pink wellies, you've got stalks in. Another bucket the same size, put a milk crate, right away a clean milk crate, and pour everything through it. Lift the milk crate out and give it a shake. It's full of stalks. The grapes have fallen through. It's a brilliant sieve. You can do this for, as I say, part of the, the stuff I want to tell you about is if you've got 20, 30 boxes of grapes, you can do them without all the electrical cooking. So I'm just whiz back to where we are. So I'm going to go on to a few do's and don'ts now. And this is, this is, this is more pictures than uh, more pictures than words. Um, I always, I don't use sulfate on grapes before they're fermented. You can do as long as you keep it to a minimum. Again, we're all into different people have got different ways of doing it. Um, I will the day before make a starter so that as soon as the fermentation comes up to temperature, the starter goes in and it is bubbling next day away. Um, I mentioned temperature there as well. Um, temperature is important. Um, yeast, yeast in red wine works up to about 35 degrees. Now, most people will say, and I certainly don't want to go over 35, my other limit is 30, but you need to put heat into red wine to get that, and, and the ambient temperature in here now feels warm, it's probably about 20, it's not warm enough. Um, I actually, and I know the technical term for it now because I read it just the other day, thermovinification. What it actually means is that I take, when, I, when, I, when it comes out the crush and it goes into there, I will take a bucket, uh, I will take a saucepan full, put it on the stove, just warm it through, bring it up to about 80 or whatever. Um, there has been times when I've been thinking about the crush and it's boiling and bubbling like so it's been doing it for five minutes and it's actually been boiled. But just warm it up, put that back in. Yeah? And do that two or three times, and it'll bring the temperature up. Bring it up to about 25, put your starter in, that will be working the next day. Is that just an initial process, or do you No, that's to get the, the these, these grapes, if we stuck a probe in the, in, in the, the must now, I would be surprised if those grapes were 10 degrees C. Yeah. It's too cold. Yeah, but no, 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 so no it's, it's just to get it up. Is, but are you using the temperature? Is that over the, like, the period of no, the No, we'll, we'll come on to that in a minute. I haven't got a photo of the next bit here. Yeah. Well, I should have done to answer your question about it, but no, we'll cover that. That brings it up to temperature. Um, and you get it to 25. It's about, in one of those, it's about four saucepans full. 
there, just to get just to get a bit of warmth in there, just so you don't shock your starter when you put your starter in there. Um, east then, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I think was the uh, was the title I've got here. Um, there are numerous yeasts. Um, my term ugly might might offend people, but I don't. Uh, I don't. I think you can do better than a general purpose yeast. Um, 116 at the top, that's a good old favourite. Again, I've had some spectacular results with 116, so this year I'm going to use something else because I'm trying to improve the recipe. It's um, available for a reasonable price from Carl. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't use airlocks. Never used airlocks. When you've got this upside down, in fact, I lift that. <coughs> That was your airlock, wasn't it? That's all right, you can go by that. I can use it. When you've got your red grape in here, this wants out. to be filled with mash. Yeah. Mash, must. No higher than half full. Because the cap will, once it gets fermented, all the grapes skins will be lifted by the gas underneath and it will come up to about, sorry, I'm going to get in here, but which you can't see, come up to about there and you'll press that down every day. Um, more room with airlocks, marvellous. All I do with this is cut open the bin bag and cover it with a bin bag, nothing more. Um, your first day, as I said, we go on your first day and you'll lift that up and there's a tremendous smell of carpet glue. That's the only thing I can, I can describe it as. It, it works. You smell it the first day and go, mm. yeah, that's fine. Everybody panics at that stage because it's quite horrendous smell of it. That's the lag. Um, proper winemakers will tell you that yeast goes to a lag stage. It's to do, I believe, uh, when it's converting the sugars, it's not actually fermenting. It's not going through ethanol fermentation at that stage. It's inverting and converting various sucroses and, and fructoses. <coughs> Um, so there's no need for an airlock, there's no need for an airlock on this vessel at all. Um, I've already covered the cap, as we're in Yorkshire I thought it was appropriate to put a cap on. This, this slide was done before with a, with a, a, a funky little uh, baseball cap and I thought it, I thought it appropriate to uh, update it. I've mentioned temperature, I've mentioned temperature a lot, we've covered We've covered crushing, sorry, we've covered crushing it with or without stalks. We've covered good quality yeast. We've covered um, do's and don'ts with airlocks. Temperature is really, really important. You don't want to go over 30. I aim for 25. You certainly don't want to be lower than 20. How do I keep that warm? I've got a little electric radiator about that size. Um, they're about 12 or 15 quid from Argos. And they've got a stat on the side. And I happen to know that if I've got my stat at about 6 o'clock, it's about 24 degrees C. And all I do is I stand it beside there. I take the basket off my basket press and put that behind the radiator. And then put the blanket over all of it. So it's got a bin bag and a blanket and we're done. That will maintain 25 degrees C there, reasonably consistent, and that will ferment like it's on simmer on the stove, it'll be bubbling. Um, the Italians actually refer to it as boiling, fermentation is called boiling, and there is some Latin history as to how that word would come about, but that is fermentation. Um, you'll notice on the bottom of this fermentation vessel, a particularly offensive device. Those of you who've read a little bit of the forum, I don't care what they look like, but don't get involved in taps. You don't need taps, um, but you've introduced a risk. Yeah? You've got however many litres, whether it's 5, 15, or 300, and then it comes apart in your hand, or it jams up because you can't get it sealed and it's dripping, which you just don't need, I think. So what fermenters can we use? 
I've fermented in all sorts of things. Um, the, if, you're, if you're buying plastic, so, and, and I know I keep saying that, these things are fantastic. They really are. Um, they're multi-purpose. By default, they come without taps. I've got to stop doing taps. <laughs> Uh, by default, they come without taps, um, but you can use them for beer, you can use them for crushing, fermenting, storage, it's a good all rounder. Uh, these blue drums work, um, I ship a few of those every year uh, to a couple of customers with grapes in, um, and this will this will horrify some purists as well. I've got a couple of guys, when they get that drum, it's full of sulfited red grapes, they will get a jigsaw out of the shed, they cut round the top. They then have a specially sterilised by Mr. Hoonslot bucket. They take a food bucket full out to get it down to about half, and then they ferment that. Because the pressing and the racking, a few bits of blue plastic that go into it, will come out of the pressing and the racking. The trick with plastic vessels is what plastic? And it wants to be HDPE. You can see, if you turn them upside down and throw some more air onto that garage, um, HDPE is it's not the only plastic, but it's the safe one, and it's also one that is, it, it doesn't carry the stain either. Um, I'm sure Bob's had read in this, there's no stain. Some plastics will take stain very, very quickly. HDPE is also food safe. Um, and black bins come in two or three different types. If you are going to use black plastic bins, let's be honest, they're only eight to include the other one. Make sure it's HDPE. Um, there is a fault with that particular one, but we'll move on. Um, fermentation bins get bigger, and that's actually a red one of those. Um, bigger is actually better. I've found that the bigger volume you do, and that's, that's one of the reasons I do less variety and bigger volume, is because I think the wine is get a better quality of wine by making it in bigger volumes. Um, we haven't covered, uh, no, so sticking with bigger volumes, if you keep moving on then, that's got to be the next logical step up. You must be, Heston cooked a bloody pig in a spa, there's no reason why we can't ferment red wine in it. That leads me nicely on to getting some air into it. Now, I've covered the, the sort of sterilisation bit. Red wine needs some air. We all go, oh no, wine must have air. Geese need air to get started. Um, when they're here, sorry, I'll not do that again. When you've got a level here, another reason for half filling this bucket is when they're going, they'll be covered in a line of CO2. That's why they don't need an airlock. They've got a bin bag and a ladder of CO2. That's enough. But what you've got to do is get rid of that. In the first two or three days, they need oxygen. Your first, we, it's called pushing the cat down, yeah? The first, you know, I keep thinking you're sucking in my okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> if I keep looking at you, it's not because there's a tricky question. Um, when you press the cat down, first few days you want to be stirring it, you want to be getting some air in, you're agitating it um, and as I say you'll, you'll notice this carpet glue smell day one even for, as I say I've got like it's almost like a boating paddle I fan it about, try and get the carbon dioxide off, get some air in, be vigorous with it about day two or three you'll see, you'll come in and say this has got a bin bag on it, it's got a blanket on it, you'll see it dishes naturally Producing that much carbon dioxide, the weight of the blanket will cause a seal around this edge. And it will be dished like this. At that point, it's producing a lot of carbon dioxide. And if you've got one of these going in here, um, with, and you've got the door shut, pay attention, because you're coming into a non-breathable atmosphere. Carbon dioxide coming up that will probably be that deep on the floor. Um, my father, who's a plumber, who knows a bit about carbon dioxide toxicity, and myself, who was done before, sat in my shed, which is a bit smaller, a lot smaller than this guy, it's a square. Um, sat there, this, this red one to go, you can run the world, isn't it? And uh, he looked at me and said, you do, do realise we're not forgetting those things, don't you? Don't you? Don't you? Don't you? Don't you? Don't We all do it, we all know about it. It's, it's not as harsh as suffocating on, on uh, sulfite. 
But it's there and it happens. You get a big boy going, pay attention, open the door, give it a few minutes to settle out. Um, this would be a good way to get some air in, wouldn't it? Just put the jets on. A couple of days with the jets on, but no. So, that's fermenting. I'm going to go on to pressing. Any questions on fermenting or do, 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 I, do I now need to put you straight on any of the stupid things that I've said and you'll uh, go away and make them on in the stomach? With the temperature when it's made around about heating it up on the stove, yeah. could you not achieve the same effect by sanitising some two in pot bottles, sticking some hot water in it and chucking them in? Yes, you could, but um, give volumes again probably, but also what you're using there is an indirect heat method. Yeah, so yes it will work. My choice was based on get it up to temperature quick because I want it under yeast quick, I want it fermenting quick because I don't want to put any sulfur in it. So it was it, it would work, yes. The, the answer is yes, but I, I would venture there's quicker, more direct ways of doing it. You're heating it up and then you've got a layer of PET mounting it and yeah. Um, yes you're absolutely right, but Moving it up on the stove for, for me was a way of getting the heat into it quicker. Is that not going to introduce sort of cooked flavours? It doesn't, but I will agree with you that it doesn't really need to boil and cover all over the stove. Um, you're looking to warm it up. I, I, I aim for 80, and I've actually got a little um, hot plate thing that's got that, that's controlled by temperature. You set it at 80, it'll actually get it to about 110 degrees. So it's completely useless. But um, <laughs> Warm it, don't boil it, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You didn't cover um, nutrients. That's interesting, you should mention nutrients. A lot of all the people grimacing at the back. Um, there's been a bit of debate about nutrients. I've made what I've made great wine since probably 2003 ish, and until this year, I've never purchased nutrients. I'm going to see if it makes a difference this year, I don't think it will, personally. Um, Red wine is made on skins. There are a lot of nutrients in the skins. If you've got stalks in, there's lots of uh, nitrogen in the stalks. Don't forget these things have been fertilised, they've been sprayed, so there's good stuff and bad stuff in the sprays. As far as wine makes it. Um, I genuinely, 100%, don't think you need nutrients, and my evidence to date is that you don't need nutrients. However, you are dealing with grapes that you don't you know you haven't spoken to the winemaker. You haven't seen the vineyards, you don't know what's happened to them. So if you want to be sure, and, and that's what nutrients is about. If you want to be sure, put a little nutrient in. And we had a bit of a, a few threads on the forum about, are we giving them a Sunday lunch, or just a little uh, cucumber sandwich, or the hard boiled egg and a very small spoon? Um, how much nutrient do you want to give them? Because there is also a school of thought that says, Nutrients can, if you overdo your nutrients, drop your flavour. So again, I'll come back to my earlier comment, it's just about patting nature in the right direction. If you're really keen on looking at your nutrients, there is um, a test. You can, you can have your grapes tested, it's called a yam test. Yeast available nitrogen. Um, I did that, right? Um, and the lab will tell you how much available nitrogen there is in your most. With these grapes, I don't think you need it. I really don't think you need it. But that's, as I say, that's my opinion. You, you, you pack nature in the direction you think of it. Any more? Okay, pressing. This is, this is, this is the, the fun bit. Um, we'll start pressing by saying, when do you press? You can press at day four, you can press at day six. I've heard people that press at day 24. Um, I know people who, sorry, I've heard reports of people who wait till the skins sink. I've never seen skins sink, personally. <laughs> <laughs> um, I base my pressing time on what sort of wine I'm trying to make, when do I want to be drinking it, what time have I got this week because I've got a job as well? It's normally between six and eight days with these grapes. Yeah? Do you start by just taking a bit of the juice and inspecting the colour? Or, uh... It's not. 
I inspect the schemes. No, you're right. Um, part, of, part of the decision making process is you can pick the schemes up and you can see a change in the schemes. Um, the schemes will look, there's, there's, there's lots of function ways to put it, but I, I would have told it will feel like a bit of Johnny when you've got it right. There's nothing. Well, this, we're going to get out of hand now, so be careful. There's nothing mushy on the inside, it's just two thin schemes, literally. Yeah. And you, you rub them together. It doesn't want to be... Oh, we nearly had some glassware right there as well. That's <laughs> the, my job, the, 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 the There doesn't need to be any... Um, it's not a good word, it's gone. Flesh. Flesh. Flesh and move. Um, yeah, there doesn't need to be any flesh left in them. And if you hold them up, they will go through stages of translucency. They will go from the dark red colour they were when you put in, through brown, through lighter brown, and I have seen skins you can almost see through. Um, when the skins start to get to that level, you're talking about getting extra tannin to them. So the rough guide is, a lighter wine, less time on the skins. A heavier wine, more time on the skins. An absolutely fabulous wine. Wait till they've dropped it. Well, no, I don't know. Uh, I, I can't recommend that. I've not done it. I'm between six and eight days. If I'm making something bigger, I'll let it go to ten. Uh, it's also relevant to how well the ferment's going. If the ferment's still bubbling away hard, I'll, I'll probably leave it a little bit longer just to get a bit more out of the out of the, um, out of the skin. While we're covering the skins, these fermenters are this shape for a reason. And it, it, when they built these, they didn't think that would fit in Bob's shed nice. Or, if you get four blows ready, you can almost lift it. There is uh, a lot of papers on tall, thin fermenters versus short, flat ones. I said to you earlier, your skins are rising, aren't they? If you've got a tall thin fermenter, the skins right at the top there are a long way from the juice. The reason we punch down every day is because we want the skins in the juice. It serves two purposes. One, it gets, it stops the, the skins getting contaminated because they're being flushed through the sterilising ferment of the, of the wine. But also, that ferment is extracting stuff out, it's working on the skins. So the ones up here aren't doing any good. Now I do push down once a day. Other people will say at least twice a day. I know people that virtually live in their cells and all like this. You can, you can pump your juice, your, I should say wine now, out of the middle because you've got three layers in there. You've got about that much skin and pips and chip. Uh, sorry, let's start that again. Pretend I didn't say that. Yeah, cut that bit from the final. I'll edit that out. <laughs> the, 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 the bottom layer is yeast leaves and pips. The pips are seen because of everything. Yeah. Um, in something like this, you often get about, I'd say about half inch to an inch of just scummy, pippy, bits of stalk and things as well. And then, as the fermentation goes through, you'll get a clear layer of your, your wine forming. And then at the top, you get about that much of skins. Um, you want to get those skins down into the wine. So, as I say, tall, thin fermenters will make a different wine to a short, flat fermenter. I think there's an argument for tall, very flat fermenters. Um, and if, I, if, if I've got the ways of doing it, I wouldn't mind, there's something I wouldn't mind trying. Because you could almost, almost get to a stage where you didn't need to push them down because they'd always be under, 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 under the juice. So presumably that's why if you go to a commercial winery, they often use the tall, thin ones because of floor <coughs> space, footprint and so on. Right. But you'll see the pumping lines Absolutely. in between. They use tall and thin, but they resolve the problem of the skins not being covered by periodically pumping over the juice from the bottom through a spray bar and then uh, sort of running through. And, and that's, a, as I say, that's a continual process. So yeah, and you, and you can punch down as often as you like, but it's, it's keep, keep the skins good, keep the extraction going. Any more questions on fermentation? Okay, um, pressing. 
we've said about when to press. Pressings, you can make pressing hard or you can make pressing easy. Um, I used to bucket all of this through my press. And I got bored with that, and there's a lot of splashing about it because it pulls out the bottom of the, uh, the press. And then there was a bucket under the press. Now, it doesn't take a lot to work out that if you bucket that through the press, that bucket is not going to come. So I've got another little bit on that. I dispensed with that idea a couple of years ago. What I've actually made is a piece of gutter pipe, about that one, round gutter pipe, and I've put a chop saw through it in places. About, there's, there's an end on it, chop saw marks, and then a bit more. And I push that through the skin. So now I'm going to do pressing, I don't disturb that. I push this piece of pipe gently through. The chop saw marks are now roughly in the wire. The cap on the end makes sure the pump doesn't suck up any of the crack and yeast leaves and pips at the bottom. And the saw cuts don't go far enough up so they pick up any skin. Well, that's the, that's the pump keeps going. When, when the pump starts, it finds skins all over the place. And I take it out occasionally and give it a deco. But I can now pump the wine out of here and the skins will settle. Um, when you've deco the, pumps, uh, the pump a couple of times, and it's straining and there's bits coming out of the other end, you do what you're doing. And then you can bucket a reasonably skin rich musk into your press. Pressing does, sorry, pressing doesn't, uh, pressed wines and the stuff I've pumped straight out are considered by some people to be two different wines. The first one is, is the free run, or the Italians call it the primo. The second one is press wine, or the second run. I've pissed about two or three years, keeping them separately. And when you come complaining, more or less, you end up putting them all back together again. So I, last year I, get, I gave up, more or less, separating them out. What you will find when you're pressing is if you through the stages of press, as, as it gets dry, the first few times you, you're, you're turning the handle, pressing the button, opening the water valve, we'll come on to the kit in a minute, you'll find that the great juice that comes off tastes pretty much like the stuff you've got in the table on you. When you start pressing it hard, you can taste a difference. You can, it, it gets more astringent, you can taste the tannins, it gets drier, it gets sharper. And you get a bit of a flavour, sorry, you get a bit of a, a, a taste for it. But I'll give you an easy guide with this one. With all but the most sophisticated presses, you can't press it too hard. The water press one well, certainly won't press it too hard. Um, you want to basically press it as hard as you fucking can. Um, because it's getting that little bit of a spin to see out and a bit more complexity out. You really do need to press it as hard as you can get that goodness and sharpness out of the way of skin. So coming on to uh, coming on to presses then, this is really the piece of kit. If you've, if you've got to start from day one and you go, what am I going to need that I can't get out of the kitchen or do with a bucket, yeah? This is what you need a press. You need some form of press. Um, I favour a basket press. Um, there's, there's arguments to and against. You've seen the water press at the top there. You've seen that's what Bob's got here today. Um, different ways of doing it. Um, I've also got some notes that a couple of people have had. Um, it's a two page PDF. If anybody wants them, let me know. This is a uh, press. It's based on, on side presses. Well, can you see? It's basically a big H shaped frame. Yeah? Um, and you build up a series of racks and a series of cloths with your grapes in. You build them up in layers and then that's a bottle jack on the top there. And you bottle jack them down. Um, the bags... So there's, there's a bag, a rack, a bag, a rack. Th these, are, these are the racks I'm talking about. All ideal bags between the racks are, are found at Dunelm. They're the cheapest white pillowcases. Um, Mr. Hoselock, no, no, I think we were washing the shoes. 
Um, fill them up, fold them in half, lay them between the square racks, stack them up, and just work them off the jack down, and jack them down. And that's a very, very efficient press. It's very easy to make. Um, this is all for two, basically. Um, it's bolted together, it's not now, so you've got to have it bolted together. You can take it apart, I built one, and the next year I took it apart and do a piece of table. But that's, 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 that's another story. Um, it, it takes up no room, you haven't got a press is a big old lumps of stuff. This you can, as I say, coach bolts, bolt it together, do your one, wash it all down, put it away, stack it up as a heap of As I say, if anybody wants, uh, I'll call it, so it's probably an email it. I think they're actually on the forum. I think so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah.
vent it out, we were talking about this last night, put gas on, vent it out a little bit, leave it under 4 psi, it's fine. We won't get a fizzy wine. Uh, we're not going to get into we're not going to get into a conversation about degassing. Uh, they, don't, they don't cause uh, there's heckling from the back there. I don't have uh, pardon me, Your Honour. I don't have a gas problem. Um, I've seen wines that do have a lot of residual gas, and I think the reason I don't suffer from it is because I pump quite a lot. I don't lift anything. But, um, whether it's in one of these or anything else, it gets pumped. I don't lift last way with one, with the exception of gas. Uh, so I think that takes a bit of it out. I don't know, I've never, even before I was pumping, I didn't know. Lots of gas in it. Five PS on a 40K won't give you a fizzy wine. Um, I've got wine boxes on there. Um, you can recycle wine boxes if you've got friends and family uh, that didn't want to have a box. You have to keep the box. Um, there's a little, and I meant to get a photo of it because I'm never going to try and describe it to you, it's going to take ages. There's a little rubber tap fitting you can get. It looks very similar to that. You shoot it on your... It's not, it's not about it's rolling about. It's not a hydrometer, we'll say. <laughs> it shoots on your tap like that and then comes down to a very fine bore. That bore, or certainly on the one I've got, will fit perfectly on the nozzle of a wine box. So you've got one box on its back, you put that on there, you can put a funnel on there, we can now wash it out. We can now fill it. Don't use sulfide. I've proved, as I've proved wrong, the sulfide takes the silver, silver line off the, uh, off the bank. It's lovely, but when you've got a white spark, it brings a whole new meaning <laughs> to white sparkling wine, having little bits of silver foil floating around it. Um, I keep them clean, I wash them out a couple of times in water, then again, splash of alcohol in them, keep some alcohol in them, it keeps them stable. When you want to fill them, on the back, put that on, That'll, that will then take a funnel, fill your wine in some siphon or bottle or jug or whatever. I jug it in because you can work your volumes out. If you've got a three litre one, pour your three, because it's a bit of guesswork, if you've just got the siphon out of and you can put it on, on scales, because three litres of wine weighs three kilos, but depending on how it's folded up inside and if you need to work it and all that jazz, if you put it in the jug it's just easy and then just pour it through. So um, that's wine boxes. Bottles we're, uh, we're reasonably clear on. Any questions on bottling? Or more to the point, dispense? So we're. Uh, we don't have any questions at all then. You're all looking a little bit dumbstruck. I've been stuck talking for too long. Do you use screw top? No. That's, a very, that's actually a very good question because we probably should have thought about it. Um, I don't use screw tops for a couple of reasons. Um, screw, top, screw cap sizes are different. Um, so you can, if you save the cap as well, make a reasonable job of it once or twice. The neck on a screw cap bottle isn't as substantial, and I should have had props for this. Um, if you put a cork in it, and there are people who, who will cork uh, bottles and tell you that they haven't had a problem, that's fine. But a screw cap bottle isn't designed to take a cork. Having said that, the normal cork does fit a screw cap bottle very well. And it's not a lot, but they slip in very well. Bob and I have both got corks that, that you could shoot down there down a lean on the hand cork and the floor cork to get them in because they're tight fit. Normal corks you can just have a pop and then pop it in. If I was going to put a cork in a screw cap, that would be it. Um, there's wrecking caps that people have used. Uh, I think they're spelled W E K I E C K I M or something like that. But, uh, they're like a, they're, they're part of a bone and another flap that go over. Um, I've got mates that use those on screw cap bottles, um, but cork is still best. Um, there is some research being done um, that screw caps don't last anywhere near as long as they should do. A commercial bottle of wine, what the commercial vintner wants to happen is that the wine leaves him and ends up on your dining table probably between three and six months, and it's exactly the same as it was when it left. 
if I'm using Glasswell alone and refer back to my earlier comment about hanging meat, hanging meat is, is, is a moving substance that is maturing. Wine is a living organism all the time. There's stuff going on in it all the time. Yeah? The cork is a natural way of it getting a little bit of breath. Um, and it does. And it needs to breathe. Just like uh, meat matures. Uh, you have a lot of air circulation around it. Wine does need to breathe. Uh, and there is a recognised problem with screw cap, commercial screw cap wine. It's called a screw flint taste. And if they, they, they basically hermetically sealed them too well. The wine can't breathe, it, it, it does something else. And it gives you a literally, and we can all sort of taste it now, so it's good thing. When I was told it, I went, yeah, I get that. It's a sort of burnt, sort of sharp, dull taste. Uh, and it's recognised, and, and the industry are working on that. That is, that is something that's going on. Does anybody, does anybody know anything about the Zork caps? Yeah, I have some. Not sure I'm a fan. It's because they seem to be uh, an easy answer in the theory that you can bang on the tops of the bottles. It's got a rip top, tamper free uh, device, but you can then bang the cap back on, kick it back on in yeah. place. Obviously, it doesn't account for any yeah, other I've, I've, I've got, I've got, I've got uh, The plastic, the, the wine can't breathe. Yeah. Um, we've got no more questions then. Well, while we're changing sets, I'll leave it with that. <laughs>